Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Rails Board meeting. I'm Michael Campbell, President of the Rails Board. This is Friday, March 26, 2021, and I call this meeting to order at 1 p.m. Emily, will you please call the roll? Sue Busenbart. <coughs> Here. Michael Campbell. Here. Kelly Cox. Here. Percy Harris. Diane Hollister. Here. Chris Kenny. Here. Tara McCone Chase. Here. Jennifer McIntosh. Here. Paul Mills. Here. Jenna McLuisi. Here. Scott Poynton. Here. Becky Spratford. Here. Thomas Stagg. Here. Beth Tuppen. Here. And Alex Vincina. Here. Thank you. In accordance with the Government Emergency Administration Act number PA 100-0640, the Rails Board of Directors finds an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent and believes it is in the best interest of Rails to hold a virtual meeting to perform essential business. Also, in order to comply with the Open Meetings Act, anyone is allowed to join the meeting as an attendee. Any comments put into the chat during the public meeting period will be read aloud. After that time, the chat feature in Zoom will be disabled. Next, we will handle guest and public comments at, the start, at, at this time. Let's start with the guest um, in Burr Ridge. Deidre, will you start? Yes, Deirdre Brennan, Rails. Monica Harris, Rails. Okay, uh, are there any public comments in Burr Ridge? Okay, how about uh, East Peoria? Oh, any guests Kendall in East Peoria? Rails. Yeah, Kemba or some Rails. <coughs> no oh, there you are. Okay, you're in the corner of the screen there. Um, um, uh, the Illinois State Library. Greg McCormick. Erin Egan. Thank you, Greg and Karen. I believe Gwen Harrison is on the phone, but I'm not seeing her on your list, so. No? Okay. Any public comments at the State Library? No. no? Okay. Um, Emily, will you read the names of the guests who are participating via Zoom? Sure. Emily Feister Rails, Ryan Hubble Rails, Jim Krieger Rails, Dan Bostrom Rails, Joe Philippeck Rails, Ann Slaughter Rails, Mary Witt Rails, and Mark Hatch Rails. Did I miss anyone? Okay, if Emily has not read your name, please state your name and your affiliation or put it in Zoom so that she can read it and add your name to the minutes. Emily, did you receive any comments via email? I did not. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay, so we will move on to the consent agenda which includes the items listed. Does anyone uh, have any items they wish to move to the regular agenda for further discussion? If not, may I have a motion and a second for the approval of the consent agenda? So I'll move, McCone Chase. I'll second, um, Chris Kenny. Okay, Emily, will you please call roll? New Busenbark. Uh, yes. Kelly Cox. Yes. Diane Hollister. <coughs> yes. Chris Kenny. Yes. Sarah McCone Chase. Yes. Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Paul Mills. Yes. Jenna Namek Luisi. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Becky Spratford. Yes. Thomas Stagg. Yes. Beth Tuppen. Yes. Alex Vencina. Yes. Michael Campbell. Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, next is Jim Krieger with the financial report. Yes, good afternoon. Um, you have the financial report, which covers the eight months uh, ended uh, February 28th, 2001. Um, the highlights are is that our revenues remain above budget um, and expenditures well below budget uh, due to defender deferral of expenditures and savings resulting from the pandemic. Um, our area and per capita uh, grant revenues uh, are above budget uh, by about 300,000. And in March, which is not on this statement, we received an additional uh, uh, payment of 1,936,144, which is the federal, federally funded portion of our grant. Uh, so we will remain above budget uh, uh, for the year. The remaining uh, funds to be received are all from the live and learn portion of our grant. They are all in, uh, put in as vouchers into the comptroller's office for dispersal, but we don't know uh, when that will be made. But the outlook has, uh, has improved um, primarily because the uh, uh, federal government has uh, just passed the, uh, um, I forget the name of it, but their, their support <laughs> act, which is going to uh, be funneling a considerable amount of funds, both uh, uh, to the federally portioned uh, of uh, state library and also uh, to the states and local governments uh, for additional support uh, for the pandemic. Uh, so hopefully that might uh, uh, reduce the backlog of bills and uh, make the uh, state payments uh, faster. Our um, investment income remains well below budget uh, due to low interest rates. Um, our expenditures were se almost 740,000 below budget. Uh, last month, the board approved uh, our granting uh, retroactive salary increases and purchasing laptop uh, uh, computers. So, uh, beginning in March, our uh, our deficit, our uh, spending uh, favorableness will decrease a bit uh, as these are incorporated. Uh, but we do expect to remain uh, below budget on expenditures for the year. Um, the last item that I have, uh, I had noted that uh, we still had a of the recovered uh, of the fraudulent check. Um, we had three checks that were stolen and cashed. We had recovered two of these. And as I finished the report and issued it, we recovered the third check in the amount of 20 $9,075. And so all of our uh, stolen funds have been recovered. Can I answer any questions? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Any You're other welcome. questions? Okay. Um, I think uh, next up is reports. We are moving along today. Um, <laughs> Uh, the report from the RELS president, I do not have a report this month. So um, so we will move to item 7.2, which is the RELS board committee reports. Uh, so uh, the advocacy report, uh, starting with Jenna, uh, with the, uh, who chairs the advocacy, adv excuse me, advocacy committee, Jenna. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, the Rails Board Advocacy Committee met on Thursday, March 11th, and we had another vibrant discussion, as we always do. We had um, many topics that we discussed during our meeting. Some of them include our report on feedback from the ILA legislative meetups. So um, different members of the Advocacy Committee shared their experiences in participating in the meetups. Um, there were some members who spoke very enthusiastically about the response that they received from their legislators. People were open, supportive, and ready to hear what we had to say. There were a few members who wished that their legislators were a bit more engaged. Um, also some folks who felt that their legislators were completely absent from discussions about libraries or really did not seem to be very receptive to hearing more about it. Um, they have not been supportive historically and don't seem to be supportive right now. And that kind of led us to really discuss how we might be able to change the conversation 
um, and to really build up more capacity and allyship and alliances to help to reach our, our legislators. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Our meeting this time really focused more on collecting school library data. Uh, Keith Curry Lance, who is a very prominent school library researcher and has uh, been at the forefront of many of the school library impact studies that um, have been conducted throughout the United States, is starting a new research project and really has noticed the absence of school library data from school libraries in Illinois. So we talked a little bit about how we might be more engaged with um, the Illinois State Board of Education and to get some information from them. Um, unfortunately, Keith and other um, and IELTS, members of IELTS have really reported the difficulty in getting school library data from ISBE. Um, and ISBE has asked that we can file a request for information in order to get that. Um, so we're gonna be moving forward with that. Um, but we really did talk a lot about um, how we can get that, um, how we can engage and help out with that school library collection, the data collection process. So we're gonna be moving forward with that um, with the rest of our discussions. We're also trying to figure out just more globally, whether it be for um, academic libraries, public libraries, school libraries, specialized libraries, how can we reach those who are not currently advocating for libraries? So I know one of the questions we often ask is who is advocating? What are the messages that are out there? But um, I know one of the things that I frequently asked and we, we talk about this, we talked about this at our meeting is uh, who's not coming to the library and why? Which led us to discuss who is not currently advocating for libraries and why? And how can we reach them? How can we let people know that it is important for them to um, advocate for libraries um, and for the services they provide, even if they're not currently library users. So um, that is going to be a big part of our work moving forward. Um, we're going to try to focus on new messages from new people in order to hear their perspectives and stories and to balance out the My Library Is work that um, Mary and her team are doing with the data collection that we're going to do. So that's something that is also uh, moving forward. Um, other dimensions that we can bring to advocacy and we're also hoping to update our statewide database proposal talking points through our work. A um, couple of other things, we, um, we heard a report um, from the meeting that took place with IELTS on March 2nd. So we were um, uh, talking a little bit about how we can, going back to our, our, uh, our potential for um, setting up those collaborations between academic libraries and high school libraries and, and how we might crosswalk standards. Um, Carolyn Kinsella, who is the IELTS Executive uh, Secretary, is extremely excited about that work and would really love to um, be engaged with that. So I think we're definitely going to be moving forward with that. Um, I know that I've heard from uh, one of our board members, Jennifer McIntosh. She and I are going to try to get some time on the calendar to be able to talk. Um, she works in academic libraries, and we're going to try to get some time on the calendar for she and I to talk about um, how we might um, get started and continuing to include Sarah McCone Chase in those conversations as well as, as uh, someone who works in academic libraries on our board. Um, I am going to get be getting some time on the calendar with Laura Turner, who is a former Rails board member. She and I have been communicating by email. Um, she works for Caterpillar. And so we're gonna be talking a little bit more about um, advocacy for specialized libraries. And I'll also be following up with um, Hallie Cox, who has been um, really involved in drafting a message to put out on specialized libraries listserv. So uh, we're, we're really hoping to engage our um, advocacy for a specialized libraries um, and specialized libraries in the rail service area. Um, lastly, I am um, working to get some time on the calendar with our board member, uh, Beth Teppen, who is not only a school library, school librarian uh, like me, um, who can really help to inform our school library advocacy efforts, but is also a trustee at uh, Silvis Public Library. So we're gonna be talking a little bit more about Prairie Cat and resource sharing and how that works at both her public library and her school library. Um, and also ways that she has reached out to community uh, colleges in her area. So lots of great things coming down the pike. I continue to be so privileged to lead the advocacy committee and I look forward to all of the next steps we're gonna take together. And Michael, that concludes my report. 
Thanks so much. Uh, I, I have to say the advocacy committee is really, really moving forward on a lot of things. So thank you. Uh, next up is the consortia committee with Paul. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the consortia committee has not met since the last rails board meeting, but it will be meeting on Monday, April 19th. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the EDI committee, the equity, diversity and inclusion committee with Diane Hollister. I have not, the um, rails EDI meeting committee has not met since our last rails meeting. We will be meeting on April 21st and again on June 15th. Since our last rails meeting, our committee, the EDI committee has uh, developed into, we created three subcommittees, and you can see that on, on our page on the side. Um, the staff training leadership at um, Adv advocacy committee, <laughs> recruitment, hiring, and retention committee, subcommittee, and the programs and outreach subcommittee as well. And each of those, um, we're formulating a calendar for each of those committees to meet via Zoom. So that's where we're at right now. Thank you, Diane. Any questions? Uh, uh, the executive committee, the executive committee has not met. Uh, the policy committee, Thomas, Tom. Well, the policy committee has not met, but we will be meeting next month. Okay. Uh, the resource sharing committee, Monica. The resource sharing committee has not met since the last meeting, but we are in the process of trying to schedule a meeting for May. Okay. Um, and the Universal <coughs> Service Committee, Sue. Uh, Michael, the Universal Service Committee has not met since the last Rails meeting. Okay. Okay. Next, we are up with Deidre with the Rails report. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see. Well, there's uh, quite a bit in your report this month, um, which, and I'll just highlight a few things and uh, explain a couple of other things. Uh, there is a a uh, a sheet that talks about the um, American Rescue Plan of 2021, which is what Jim was referring to, and it highlights what the library uh, uh, funding summary is. And um, <clears throat> I, as I understand, and, and I think Greg might speak to this later, Greg McCormick, uh, still trying to figure out how, what the money is that's coming to Illinois in what ways. Uh, it's, um, it's not just coming to the state library, the money that libraries might be able to um, access. There's a lot of uh, funds going to uh, state and local governments um, and for broadband and for education. So we really um, have to uh, get ourselves organized so we can uh, be sure that we get access to the money that we want to get access to. And Diane Foote at ILA is, is, is um, leading the effort <clears throat> to, uh, you know, get a sort of a plan together. So she asked me to um, ask you when we, you know, know what we want to be advocating for that if you will be helpful in that. And I'm sure that you will be. Um, the, um, there's also, we also included uh, the quarterly reports. I think they are quarterly um, from the, uh, the LSAPs that just sort of give you some information on their services and helps you see how much they differ, but also things that they share in common. Um, and um, uh, going back to my written report a bit, uh, uh, so there was uh, just to update you on Realm, uh, there was a meeting this week with. Um, uh, members of the um, CDC vaccine <coughs> team, and uh, they uh, I, they they had a you know did a PowerPoint, and it was it was very much focused on um, 
uh, you know, getting people to trust the vaccine and how libraries and even museums can help with that. So I'll, I'll send you all that, uh, re that uh, slide deck. It's very interesting, a lot of good resources for libraries. Uh, they're also, the CDC, I mean, is, um, is planning a webinar, I think in April. So we're either going to have uh, somebody from their vaccine team at, at one of our member updates, or we'll just tag on to this webinar. So I think that will be very helpful. Um, let's see, the election is, we're, today is the final day for board nominations to be submitted. We've gotten a lot of nominations. Uh, we've, we've gotten our our quest for diversity has definitely uh, paid off, both in terms of uh, geography, job title, ethnicity. So it's, it's we're very pleased about that. Um, and uh, I think lastly, um, Monica is going to say a few words about there. There's also included an ALA report on vaccines. If you want to say a few words about that, Monica. Sure. So there is a meeting of ALA council that is uh, in part going to discuss this report coming up on Wednesday, March 31st. So I haven't seen the, the presentation on the report yet, but I think that the report itself has some good, interesting information just in terms of looking at uh, you know, kind of all over the country, how this issue is being uh, managed. So you can see, you know, this came out of a request that emerged at ALA Virtual Midwinter, which uh, I believe it happened on Tuesday, January 26th, for a request to look at asking the CDC to recategorize library workers from 1C to 1B. Uh, at that time, I think library workers had appeared in 1C just as of January 19th, so it was pretty new, um, and they weren't really sure how that was going to move forward. Um, as many of you may know, ALA does have a protocol when they are looking at things that they consider to be state and local issues, and this was one that they did consider to be a state and local issue. Through the report, they do go through and kind of explain their reasoning for that. Um, but some of the things that I think you might find uh, interesting were included in some of the graphs that resulted from the survey of state associations that begin on page six. Um, only 41 states responded to this, so it isn't an exhaustive piece, and it does reflect the reality of February 8th through March 2nd, and of course a lot has changed uh, even since March 2nd, but in terms of being a snapshot in time, it really does show you uh, en masse kind of what is happening, how library and library workers are prioritized in terms of different states. Um, one interesting thing was about how the vaccine rollout plan was consistent. Uh, was it consistent across the entire state or does it vary by local jurisdiction? Uh, only 36% said that it does vary across local jurisdiction, while 63% of those responding said it was the same across the state. Um, but again, I think they said only two states responding to the survey uh, said that uh, they were doing exactly what the CDC guidelines were. Every other state that had responded said they were doing, at least in some level, changing the prioritization. Um, there were 19 states that said they had done their own advocacy to their state in terms of advocating for vaccinated workers to be included in 1B or in 1C. Um, but of the 19 responses, uh, that advocacy did not result in a statewide change. So 100% of those who responded that they had done that did not see a change from that. And so in part, I think that's why their recommendation was to not uh, intervene as ALA and consider this a state and local issue. So um, again, the, the fuller report will be at ALA Council coming up in March, but there was some interesting information. Any questions? That concludes our report. Happy to take questions. Okay, anything else? Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, Dan Bostrom with the member engagement. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, this has really flown by. I mean, this meeting has gone so fast. Um, I'm shocked that it's already me. Um, and here comes Dan to just kind of slow the meeting down. I'm sorry if that that actually happens. Um, so I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all a little bit about member engagement. Um, you see that I've uh, I've included a document uh, in in your um, uh, in your list of documentation. Um, just kind of wanted to give you sort of uh, introduction to some of the approaches that we use. 
Um, you know, I'll try to hit the highlights here. Um, you know, when we think about Rails, uh, there are a lot of challenges um, to engaging every type of member, um, you know, geographic type, um, priorities, even things like hours and the way that and the way that the different types of libraries work um, and things like that is kind of a challenge uh, to navigate. So, um, you know, I, I kind of think of member engagement um, as sort of a mixture of four things. I think <clears throat> I think of it as like outreach. I, I think of it as customer service. I think of it as marketing and then communications. And you know, those two things kind of go together. But um, so, so we try to basically the theme of this report is we're trying a lot of different approaches. There's no one single tool that's gonna you're gonna be able to engage everyone. You really have to uh, you know spread things out and kind of make sure that um, you're hitting everyone in the way that they want to be you know reached. Um, you know, certain communication tools are going to work for some groups, and soon they're not going to work for others. So, um, so that's uh, really a big part of it. Um, you see the the first part, section I have on there is suspended approaches. Um, you know, when I first got to Rails, uh, I was doing a lot of in-person site visits. Obviously, I'm not doing a lot right now. Um, and uh, the same with in-person networking. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with those uh, after the pandemic is over. Um, but I, I've pretty much replaced in-person um, networking with those online roundtables. I've, I've just completely found that uh, you can engage more people that way. Um, and every people get people from all over get to participate, not just people who can drive um, from a specific, you know, it, within an hour of, of a certain location. Um, you know, uh, so online site visits, we, we've really started to do a lot more of those. And I will say that they, um, they kind of are as uh, like on an uh, as needed basis. Um, so the, one of the best ways that we can engage people is when they are new or when they want more information from us. So we do that in the form of our uh, new director welcome meetings. And those are offered to uh, public school, academic and special libraries. Um, and, uh, you know, the majority of them are public um, and, uh, you know, they're kind of seasonal. Um, so you'll see more probably in like June and July. There just seems to be some more hiring um, happening during that time. And then um, for some reason, also at the end of the year, so like December, January, we see an uptick in those. Um, and those are all done over Zoom. It's a chance to talk about what's available with the system, you know, what, what we're doing, um, things, ways that we can help them, ways that they can communicate. Uh, we do a lot with school libraries uh, at the beginning of their school year. So uh, I did about 40 this year in, uh, er, in 2020 in, in September and October. Um, and they're a lot of fun because uh, there are a lot more school librarians out there than there are um, any other, um, you know, any other like uh, main librarian at, their, at the agency. So um, getting a chance to connect with them is always uh, a blast. Um, okay, online networking. So the roundtables, as I mentioned, those are a big part of what we're doing. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to mention a little bit uh, about how we choose our topics because I was wondering, because I'm, I'm guessing that that was something you were all interested in. Um, and we kind of do it in three specific ways. Um, you know, the first is sometimes it's tied to like a Rails initiative. So we did an online roundtable um, in the fall that was all uh, based on Find More Illinois. And I had my, uh, my colleague, um, Eric Bain, speak about um, find more Illinois. And then we kind of talked about interlibrary loan and how schools are doing it. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Um, another way that we do um, online roundtable or that we choose topics is when they're suggested to us by our members. Um, in the fall, we did one around genre verification of, of school libraries, uh, or actually uh, just small libraries. And that was suggested by a member. It was great. I said, that, that's a wonderful topic. Would you speak? And then we recruited two other people and we kind of did it as a panel and it was a lot of fun. Um, and we had a great number of participants in that one. So it was a lot of fun. And then the last one is, you know, I'll, I'll see topics, uh, especially on our email list that seem to have a lot of interest. And so I'll just try to recruit somebody to come and speak about it. Uh, we did that in the fall, uh, again, with an elections um, one that was uh, one particular library that had a really great um, that had really great materials to kind of support elections, uh, local elections in their um, in their community. And so I asked them to um, to do an online roundtable. But, um, you know, as you can see, that's a that's one of the ways I think we're really doing a, a lot of good um, for in terms of member engagement. And we can really hit different libraries, different types of libraries with those. So, you know, sometimes we'll kind of choose a topic that's more school library focused or special library focus um, or we'll work with like academic libraries or something like that. Um, along uh, with uh, online or online roundtables, uh, you know, we do a lot of outreach to networking groups and uh, professional associations. And, um, you know, we, I, as uh, Deirdre has talked to you about in the past and Monica as well, um, we are currently just kind of uh, 
at the tail end of our of our outreach effort to the networking groups. Um, there are over 80 of those groups, and it's great to hear from them. It's so much fun to hear what they're doing. Um, I really feel like this is a great way to meet people who might not know a whole lot about Rails, but um, who you know who Rails indirectly every single day impacts the work of their libraries. Um, and so it's a great chance to kind of talk to them, hear what's going on, um, find out ways that we can sort of help them. Um, so that's been uh, a lot of fun. Um, I will also mention that uh, in my position, I, I'm really fortunate to be able to do a lot of collaboration with um, some of the professional associations in our state. Um, and I'll mention uh, just a couple. So IACRL is the uh, academic um, div uh, forum of, um, um, of ILA, Academic Library Forum of ILA. Um, and in the past, uh, we've worked together. Um, we've held online, uh, online events. So we held an event called Spark, uh, which was a chance for academic libraries to kind of come together, networking presentations. Um, it was a really great, uh, really great opportunity. And then um, off, based off of that, we've done some more town halls and they've been really popular. I just feel like ICRL is really doing amazing stuff right now. Um, and if you want to know more, you can ask Sarah McCone Chase um, or any other <laughs> academic librarians um, out there. Um, I, uh, I've been really involved in SLA Illinois. Um, as you may know, I'm the president elect. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're doing this spring, actually very excited about this is we're hosting um, a uh, SLA Midwest symposium for the second year in a row. Um, and uh, that is, that's gonna be really fun. We're bringing in speakers. We're working with other SLA communities from around the Midwest, um, Indiana, Iowa, and Michigan. Um, we're bringing in speakers from all over, bringing in the SLA Illinois, uh, the SLA um, headquarters president um, and, to speak at that. And so it's gonna be a fun event. Um, and, and I feel like we've been, I've just, you know, th that's been a, that's been a really fun chance for me to get to know more about specialized libraries and what they do. Um, we also actually have, have a collaboration with the health science librarians of Illinois, um, coming up next month, we're going to do a panel presentation. So we're trying to get speakers, um, around that area. And then all the things that we do with aisle. I mean, uh, you, you've heard about, uh, a lot of the things, a lot of the collaborations we've had with aisle. Um, I've worked very closely with them specifically on these, my library is grants. Um, that I reported about last month. Uh, uh, we announced those. Um, that's been, or actually, I'm sorry, it was this month. It's in this month's report if you want to read about those. Um, that's been great, and I'm excited for the, their work. They're, they're doing um, just really cool things, really cool projects. Um, and then the last one I'm going to mention is the My Library Is Advisory Board or Advisory Team. And we just had our meeting yesterday, um, and that's been a lot of fun. They're kind of giving us a lot of great advice about what to do with the My Libraries campaign. They're writing constant blog posts. I really hope that you're staying on top of those um, and reading those. Um, and there's going to be a lot more cool stuff um, coming up, so, so check that out. Um, that's a little. That's it on the outreach side of things. Um, I'll also just kind of me briefly mention these email lists. Um, again, we have a ton of different email lists for our members. Um, there's there's a lot of different uh, ones they can subscribe to. I put this, the link to the stats in there. You can see it's really grown in both subscribers and posts. In 2020, we had like a banner year, and I wonder if it was related to the pandemic and people just really needing an outlet to communicate. Um, I, I don't. I'm I'm curious as to how those are going to go in 2021 if they're going to continue to grow or not, but we'll see. Um, but then I'm also active on some of the other um, lists that we host. Um, so we host the aisle email list um, and, and I'll post frequently about Rails, uh, you know, uh, uh, resources that are available to school libraries. I'm also, um, I'm also on the ICRL list, I'll post there. Um, and then of course the SLA Illinois list as well. Um, social media, we're doing some fun things. And I will say that I'm supported by a great team of, of folks. Um, I don't do it alone. Uh, we have uh, five other members of the rail staff um, who participate and um, help come up with ideas for posts, help come up with ideas for contests. Um, you know, we, we did a, we did, we've done a, sh a show and tell activity. Um, the Rails Minute was something that we uh, kind of came up with as a team. So um, you can kind of see that uh, this is part of what we would like to do in the future. Um, I put some kind of future approaches. I don't want to talk too much about that because I don't have concrete plans on any of those things. Uh, but I will say that I, uh, I talked to some uh, Rails Library staff members back in, uh, the, back in September of 2020, um, just having kind of just a series of like eight or 10 conversations with people. How would you like to be engaged? And a, a lot of them were non-library directors. A lot of them were people that knew a little bit about Rails, wanted to know more. Um, and these were some of the things that they suggested. 
you know, um, finding new ways to sort of engage um, people that aren't directors, um, doing more short videos, um, offering more resources for networking groups. And I think we're making our way towards those things. Um, it's always going to be slow, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm still scheming in some of these areas. Um, so that's kind of my report. Uh, at this point, I'm going to open it up to any questions or feedback that you all want to give. This is Becky. I love the, I made a note when I was going through earlier, <clears throat> the more outreach to the regular library workers, I think is super key. I'm glad you noticed it. That's like the one thing, one of many things that this last year exposed is how little library staff know about not just how decisions are made, but how everything works. Mm -hmm. And it's like a terrible time to have to catch them all up on it. Excuse me. Um, I know that Joe Filipek and I are doing a presentation at Reaching Forward that is exactly geared toward the um, boots on the ground library workers. And we're coming at it from the we're librarians and we're trustees perspective. So I think there's a lot of interest. People are asking for this information. So I'm really glad that you've pulled that out and, and are trying to do that. I really think that's a great place for us to focus because they need to know what we're offering. Yeah. Because not every director is good at explaining to their staff what's going on so thank you for filling that yeah you know and it also sort of speaks to some of the more modern approaches to management of organizations and how some organizations are becoming a little bit flatter and people are able to lead from wherever they are in the library um, and I really like that idea, and I and I um, and I hope that um, I I always think so. I always think that the network that like we get a lot of people coming out of the networking groups who are uh, who aren't library directors but have great ideas and have really like interesting uh, you know um, really interesting skills and things to offer our community because we are community um, and and so um, I, I I really do my best to try to help support those people and their work. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I think, um, I think that's, I, I agree. I think that's super important. Well, if there's nothing else, I thank you for letting me be here and talk about what I do. Um, I could talk about it all day. I, I did, it looks like I didn't <laughs> go too long, but, uh, I, I, uh, if you ever have any questions, you know, you can always email me or whatever. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, next up, um, we'll hear from the State Library. Well, good afternoon and greetings from everyone here at the State Library and Secretary of State Jesse White. Um, it's good to join you all here today. Um, certainly, many things have changed since the last meeting, um, and it's all, I would say, very good news for uh, the State Library, libraries within the state, and even the library system. So um, the Secretary's budget has moved forward through um, the committee hearing processes um, with, you know, sustaining funding at the FY21 levels for library and literacy programs, which is, is very, very good. Um, certainly what has been mentioned about the American Rescue Plan Act, that is big news since the last meeting. Um, the state library has um, initial indication of what that means. It will be over $4.7 million to be expended in federal money. Um, very similar to what we have to do with our ongoing LSTA appropriation funding. Um, it will need to be expended by September 30th of 2022. Um, we met last week um, along with other state library agencies with IMLS um, regarding their expectations or their initial expectations for this funding, um, some guidelines, and we will meet again with them next week. Um, all LSTA coordinators will be um, there will be some discussion about this and then put together some very high level plans of how this might be implemented. We, of course, do have to, like so many other states, incorporate this into the state's budgetary process, but that's already underway. Um, but that's it's a significant increase when you think about, you know, we typically are getting five and a half million and now we will be well over $10 million in federal funding for fiscal year 22. 
Um, certainly we wish it were ongoing, but that's not um, the case with this federal funding. Um, and yes, this handout is very useful, I think, for everyone to be aware of about the other provisions within the American Rescue Plan Act and what impact there will be upon local libraries. Um, I know that the Library Association is encouraging um, local public libraries to be looking at what's going into the local governments from the $360 billion. Um, certainly that money um, or that pool of money is also going to impact what occurs here at the state level with the state's regular operation budget. And yes, we do hope that we see some improvement um, with release of state funds to grantees, vendors, et cetera, um, which we have already seen some recent improvement of that. And, and so we hope that that continues and stays positive. Um, with all of this, you know, we're of course moving forward with um, plans for FY22, receiving grant applications, uh, the two regional library systems and the Chicago Public Library System um, have received their application documents for system funding for FY22. We're anxious to uh, see those coming back and move those grant awards forward. Um, we are accepting applications through March 30th for FY22 Project Next Generation grants. Um, so a reminder to anyone who may be interested in applying for that, Public Library Construction Act funding, the annual deadline for submission there is April 15. Um, we will be sitting down with our review committee regarding the Live and Learn construction grant applications that we received. Um, that meeting will occur on April 8th. Um, we believe that those awards will be forthcoming quite shortly thereafter, um, based upon what we know is contained in those applications and the funding level available. Um, so again, that, that's good news for um, the public library applicants there. We did just award, uh, I guess it was the yesterday morning, the notices went out to school library grants regarding their FY21 funding and the awards from the school library per capita grant program. Um, so that has moved forward. And in the end, um, we awarded quite a few. We were quite concerned with the level of applications we had received on the cutoff date um, when we were missing about 20% of those expected, but um, that did correct itself and those awards have been made. Um, public library per capita grant applications have all been received at the state library and um, we believe that all but one eligible library in the state has now applied. So that is very good news as well. So and good work um, on the part of the, each of the regional library systems on making sure we were diligent in contacting the public libraries about that. So um, that's really all I have to share today. Questions? Hey, Greg, this is Scott. I, I'm just curious, do you know um, at which rate the public library per capita grants will be paid out at yet? Well, um, I would guess for public library per capita, it may be the higher rate. We are following very closely Senate Bill 2232 um, and where that, what impact that may have yet even on the FY21 school grants, um, which could be possibly amended. So um, we'll, we'll see what occurs with that. Um, the language is a bit different for public library per capita than the school library grants. Uh, this is Beth Teppen. I received my award for the school library grant and was surprised. So did the um, did the legislature legislature not increase the um, per student? So there's two processes that must occur for these for the per capita grants. There's the budget piece, which the secretary received in his budget, which is the increase of actual dollars to allocate. But each of those programs is governed by 
a statutory rate at which requires a change in that statute as well to allow the payment to actually occur. That change is what is now contained in Senate Bill 2232. It was contained in previous legislation, but did not get acted upon by the House. Okay. Before then, they adjourned for the new session. So. Um, oh, it's just escaped my mind. Sorry. I'll, if I think of it, I'll raise my hand again. No, that's fine. Uh, Greg, I have a question about the uh, the one time funding that's coming from the American Rescue Plan. Um, do you have any idea yet, or is this what you're meeting about with IMLS, uh, whether it will be whether it will be uh, you know whether there will be specific things that you must use it for, like existing programs or um like delivery for example or if you can use some of it for you know capitalization of well like for example again delivery in terms of you know buying some um you know modern more modern equipment do you, do you have any idea how what they're going to tell you i think there's going to be a mixture of things if but for equipment purchase this purchases specifically because we've discussed this here at the state library um purchase by purchase, grant by grant, would need prior approval by IMLS, um, which can slow that process. It doesn't mean it's not impossible. Um, they've set some, you know, some high level parameters so far. Um, as far as a continuation of things, there are some things that certainly they would like to see some continuation of from what they passed with the CARES Act funding and what was implemented mm -hmm. in the state. But of course, the pool is four times as large now. So um, we'll be looking at some other options. Um, and there's still some discussion about, you know, what planning documents will be necessary from each of the states um, to be mm -hmm. given to IMLS. So um, much to work out. They can't even, they've given us the estimated allocation, which I'm sure is the real amount, um, but there are significant, I guess, federal budget issues that or processes that you know, still need to be um, worked out. And at the earliest, we may have an, an official award of the states may have official awards sometime in April. Um, so we, we, certainly as we get more information, um, we will be sharing it and we're trying to certainly I know the ideas you've shared with me about possibilities. Um, we're gathering that in in any conversations that we've had with libraries and what we've seen with applicants um, in all of the program areas where we're trying to identify mm -hmm. what is a need that we can be seeing for school libraries, what are we seeing in the public library community right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there probably are some changes in that information based upon what's occurred with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did send Greg my, uh, you know, initial list of, you know, what I think we should spend the money on, because <laughs> I'm sure he wanted to know. <laughs> but, if you don't say anything, <laughs> it won't be there. Thank you. I, I, I know you don't really know yet, but I'm, of course, very interested in yeah, I mean, you know, they've continued to have like the PPE category that we funded as something that they feel people need, but it's a higher level at this point. It's, you know, how are you going yeah. to protect your facility, your staff Got in it. a greater yep. way? You can't use this for construction, but you could use some of it for infrastructure costs. So yep. um, we'll, right. we'll see what what comes out of that. Yes, thank you. And Nate. there I is interest, I will say, and this is an interest of rails, you know, from the state library agency level about um, the issue of online resources, but there's a problem with that because of the expectations of IMLS that the service date has to end on September 30, 2022. So, 
Yeah. Um, that makes that very yep. challenging. Got it. I, yes, I understand that. Okay, one yes, more question. Question. Hello. I don't know. Go ahead, Beth. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so you kind of implied that the per capita applications from schools had to be chased down. And I wonder if we could use some of that data to try to figure out who is applying and which schools may um, may not have gotten the information to the right person. Maybe that's some way of a finding out, you know, where those holes mm -hmm. are. Yeah, and I, yep. I think that's an ongoing discussion we're now having with the regional library systems about yep. capturing more data about the schools. Um, the school grant and the membership into the library system is at the district level. So we know that consistently there are 600 plus school districts that are applying for this funding and getting it. What we don't know at the state library level necessarily or the system level is what's behind that as far as the actual number of schools who's staffing those schools, what's the mm -hmm. um, situation within each of those individual schools. That's what we all right. need more information from. I think that, you know, as far as the grant applications, um, we still are very reliant and um, getting that information to the district offices because the statutory requirement is that, that that's issued at the district level for every qualifying school within the district. So um, we are trying to address that um, and hopefully much sooner than um, we have some more information before the next application period for this grant program. We'll see how successful we are. I think a lot of it was just the communication with so many people being in and out of the offices last mm -hmm. fall. It, um, yep. So then I have a question, it might be too early to answer. I know that there's a bill right now about school district consolidations that's moving forward in the, I'm not sure if it's the House or the Senate. Is that gonna also make our job more difficult if they get consolidated further? Because then we have even less connection. Certainly it changes the ma makeup of your members dependent upon how schools would consolidate. Do we have any idea if that actually is, I mean, I know it's moving forward, but do we have any sense that it's got momentum? I have not really followed that bill that closely. Um, we can certainly look at it, but it, it would have an impact upon um, system membership, eligibility for the school grant program. I would presume that, you know, if no individual schools are closed in that district consolidation, um, that wouldn't necessarily impact the grant program as much. It would impact library system services. Um, it has even caused, I will say in historically, changes in library system boundaries because those districts can cross. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it will have impact. I think the imp impetus there was to consolidate the administrative offices. Karen, do you want to? Is that I do. I just I just have a quick statistic for you. On the school grants submitted this year, there were 2,652 buildings um, that were eligible for the grant. So we're going to do a quick comparison to see how that looks compared to last year. Oh, we'd love to know that. Yep. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for all that info. It's great. Any other questions for the Illinois State Library? Okay. Thank you, Greg and staff. So, okay. Uh, on to new business. Uh, Dan is up again with a new member. 
Yeah, thank you, Michael. You just cannot get rid of me. Um, thank you all. Uh, we, we have a new uh, we have a new member. And this one, I will say, was actually just like tied up in a bow for me. Um, I, I want to start by thanking um, my colleague uh, Ann Slaughter and uh, Jennifer Slaney, who is the director of the Sterling Public Library, and also the school librarian uh, Christine Schaff at Rock Falls High School, who have already started the conversation with uh, this particular school, uh, the Center for Change. Um, they are a, um, they're kind of a regional school. They're associated with the ROE for uh, number 47, which serves uh, Lee, Ogle, and Whiteside counties. Um, they're, they're pretty small, but uh, they are interested in doing more and offering their students more access to library services. Um, they, uh, they had conversations with them about um, about joining Rock River Library Consortium, obviously. And, um, and then when I met with them last week, we talked about uh, e-read, um, being able to access things like BiblioBoard, giving students the opportunity uh, there. Uh, they do have a school librarian and, um, you know, she was interested in some of the continuing education that we offer as well. Um, so this one, I think uh, they've, already, you know, when I talked to them, they already knew plenty about Rails and, uh, and obviously the only way that they can join the Rock River Library Consortium is to be part of Rails. So um, if anybody has any questions, I would uh, be happy to take them. Great. If there are no questions, may I have a motion to approve the Center for Change School for full membership in Rails as presented and requested for final approval from the Illinois State Library? So moved. Moved. Seconded. Emily, will you please call roll? <clears throat> sure. Kelly Cox? Yes. Diane Hollister? Yes. Miss Kenny? Yes. Sarah McCoon Chase. Yes. Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Paul Mills. Yes. Jenna Namekluisi. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Becky Spradford. Yes. Thomas Stagg. Yes. Beth Teppen. Yes. Alex Vancina. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. Michael Campbell. Yes. Thank you all. Okay, motion carries, okay. Next up is item number 8.2, which is a joint meeting with IHLS and ISL. So Deidre, do you uh, wanna lead that discussion? Sure, uh, this uh, was something that we had talked about when Paul was president. Um, and uh, then for reasons we all know, it just fell by the wayside. Um, I think, though, that really, you know, having this meeting virtually is a lot easier than having it in person. Maybe not as great, but, as, you know, certainly simpler. It was something that uh, Becky asked me about, and I said I would put it on the agenda. Um, that's as far as we've gotten, really. Why don't you just check the willingness? You want to you say anything, Becky? I mean, yeah, I, I know Greg is gone from the meeting. <laughs> okay. but, um, He'll be back. <laughs> yeah, when Paul brought it up, I was really intrigued by the idea and... Some of the stuff we'll talk about in the board engagement survey too, it just haven't been chances to connect. And with meetings being virtual anyway, it just seems like a good chance to have a virtual meeting with as many library people as possible. It seems like it would be the easiest time ever to connect. And also because of all the things we've seen with the pandemic, it's just a time for us to all put our heads together and work together to try to make sure we're all doing serving people the same way and there's things we can learn from what you know they're doing i know we report to each other regularly sort of informally but it would just be kind of nice to see who those people are and let them see who we are and see how we're all working together we used to do it yeah every year i don't know if karen if you want to say anything about it yeah, it was it was a joint board meeting. It was a wonderful opportunity to bring the two boards together to discuss statewide issues. And each yep. board called their meeting to order and then adjourned at the end of the meeting. So it was with the, within Robert's Rules of Order. But um, it was a uh, good discussion always when we had those. Yep. Part of my thing was like too, if we get in the habit of doing it again mm -hmm. because it's easier virtually uh it'll become more of a habit and it won't 
be as disruptable by large scale events such as a pandemic. So True. If, when you have a habit, it's easier to just keep it going. And even if it was a couple times a year, you know, if we're allowed to do it virtually, I mean, we still are, so we might as well take advantage. So I don't if you if the state library has no objection and if you uh, if you uh, want me to reach out to Heartland and see if they want to if they're interested if this board is if our board is interested uh, well, I think it would heard, be very we've heard, from, we've heard from one person let's hear from some other people agree. yep. Surely there's some other people who have some opinions on this. Uh, this is Scott. I, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think we should pursue it. I don't really have anything else to add. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. I agree. I think it's a good idea. I, I don't see any harm in having uh, uh, enhanced discussions. <laughs> We can put our heads together about how to spend all that money. There you go. That's a great reason to initiate the conversation, actually. <laughs> Greg is laughing. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really kidding. I mean, you know. I mean, but. there's truth in it. <laughs> I think it's also a great idea. I also think we're going to have the age old problem of figuring out scheduling and the best times of day to have these types of engagement opportunities. Um, I know mm -hmm. that for myself as a school librarian, things that are scheduled during the school day don't work for me. So things in the evenings, um, even something on a weekend would work for me, but I know that that's not the case for all other uh, library workers for other library types. So um, we might think about uh, scheduling um, several of them so that people from other library types or all library types can be engaged. So um, I just wanted to put that out there I know that that's yep. getting more into the finer details, but um, that'll be definitely something for us to consider. Mm -hmm. Well, I will actually second something Jenna said. I mean, I, I think we should be open to considering alternative times and days to meet, including weekends. I mean, periodically, we've, I've inadvertently got a, a doodle poll to meet on a Saturday, and I've always said, yes, I'm happy to do it if that's when it works for everyone. So I'd certainly be open to meeting at a, at a different time if that would you know, help facilitate getting both boards together. Or if it happens more than once, particularly, I'd say just looking for a critical mass of attendance from each group might be another way to think of it. Because you can come one time, but you, you can't come the next time. You know, it's if you notice more than one opportunity to have that engagement, maybe we don't have to all be present to meet the goal. All right. Well, we'll see what we, I'll, I'll talk to Leslie and I mean, like I, we we did have a meeting with uh, Paul and I with uh, um, IHLS to start talking, and then it just fell apart. So we'll resume those. Thank you. Thanks for bringing it up, Becky. Okay. Uh, item number eight point three, which is our FY twenty twenty two budget. Uh, Deidre and Jim. Yep. Thank you, Michael. So um, I'll, this is just a preliminary conversation. Uh, we did get the um, area per capita grant application from the State Library. It's due on June 1st, as it always is. Uh, we build our budget from the ground up every year, and Jim can talk more about that. Um, you know, this um, the money that we have is that we get from the through the area per capita grant um, is our funding source. We do get like the census grant or, you know, grants from the state library to redo L2, but those are project specific and they go away when the project is done. So um, it's, it's a little less than $10 million a year. And it's the same amount of money that we've had since 2012. Um, things are getting very tight. Um, I, I am pretty sure we'll be uh, doing some deficit spending or we'll be proposing some deficit spending for FY22, uh, which, you know, you can, we could make the case that it's money that we would have spent this year, except for the pandemic. So maybe it's just sort of like not really deficit spending, but of course that's just one way of looking at it. Um, 
But the fact remains that prices are going up, have been going up every year. Um, you know, the cost of delivery, we, we have an annual price increase for that. We have salary increases. Now, of course, we want to give them. Um, we have uh, um, increases in all of our, all of the cost of all of our programs, um, you, you know, e-read, um, you know, CE programs. I mean, obviously, the price is going up and our funding is not. Um, I do hope that we might get some relief from the state library, and this has nothing to do with the American Rescue Act money necessarily. Um, perhaps with you know the purchase of uh, vehicles, some sort of one-time expenditures, they have helped us out with that a number of years ago. Um, uh, we don't know what the outcome of the census is going to be. It might be that our population increases might be that it doesn't, I don't know, then that I would think would increase our portion of the APC, but I don't know how that might work either. Um, we, so yeah, I think uh, we, we definitely are gonna, if we're not gonna get more money this year, we're gonna need to be looking for an increase in, the, um, in our annual funding, um, you know, certainly for next year. Um, so Jim, do you wanna talk about where you are with, uh, building the budget? Uh, sure. Um, well, as, as uh, Deidre was saying, we constructed from the ground up and, and I've asked all the directors uh, to give me estimates of the spending of all their major programs. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, uh, all these, uh, the directors want to continue these programs, which we think uh, have a lot of value uh, to our constituents and uh, plus a few more. <laughs> so we're, we're also looking at possible expenditures to uh, uh, up, update uh, or redo our strategic plan, uh, some increase in the grants uh, to libraries and uh, uh, level funding to the LSAPs among other things. And, uh, and of course we, we have put in a salary increase uh, and as I, I told Dee, our personnel budget basically increases every year as we give uh, uh, ways and salary increases. Uh, uh, but our uh, area per capita grant uh, has not increased much. We did get, um, it hasn't stayed exactly the same uh, since we got a small bump in, in fiscal year 2014 for the census and then uh, one in uh, 2019, I believe. Uh, uh, but overall, it's only 4% higher than it was in fiscal year 12. And we also uh, had two years in which we only got 60% of our uh, uh, grant funding. So um, we, um, but every, every year it's getting uh, harder to balance a budget. But uh, so right, we now, right now we're looking at uh, possibly a, a couple hundred thousand deficit, which should be uh, Less than, uh, but this year we're looking at several hundred thousand of expenditures below our budget. So they basically should balance uh, with, with that. So we're working on it now. We what we have done in the past um, is bring you in April um, a narrative about what we plan to do, or you know what, and you know based on what the, the state library expects us to do. I mean, obviously it doesn't change that much. Uh, um, and also some sort of, you know, preliminary uh, budget numbers. We don't, haven't historically brought you the entire package, which includes many appendices. Um, we don't want to kill that many trees or, but, I mean, certainly it's available online. It used to be about the trees now, it's, it's, but it's also about just how much you really want to read some of you. <laughs> I know some of you want to read the whole thing. <laughs> um, anyway, um, and then in at in the at the May meeting is when it needs to be approved so that it can go to the state library by June first. Um, so the, just to give you a, a you know a preliminary take on it. All. Any questions or comments? So I have a question. This is Becky. 
So I really appreciate this information and this idea, especially Jim explaining it about while we'll have deficit spending, it will even out because of the pandemic and all that, but that's kicking the can down the road. Yes, it is. And so, which I totally understand doing. So my question is from a board perspective, will we have ways that we can help advocate to make this a better situation in the future? Mm -hmm. Besides just sitting here and saying, this is what it is. And I get that at now we're at that point. That's like the next step I would be interested in when we. Sure. I, and I think the first, the first thing we have to do is to put everything on the list I agree. and show you why we need to keep doing it or why we're spending this money on what we're spending. on. I mean, you know, we had a conversation here last month. I think the there's there's a desire for the piece of the pie. That's the LSAP funding to be made a bigger piece of the pie, not just level funded. Um, so there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of need out there right now. Um, it's been and it's been increasing. So the first thing we do is just show you, tell you, you know, th these are the programs. Um, this is what it costs. This is how it's used. Um, and then, you know, that's the source of some advocacy, I think. Yeah, and I'm concerned that it will look okay to the members. Oh, well, it's all evening out. But I think, I feel like it's our job as the board members to remember, to remind them that it might look okay, but it's because of pandemic savings, federal money. Like we have to be really cognizant of that message. Yep. Um, and I'm just sort of saying it so it's out there. Yep. But after we get the budget passed, I think we're going to have to spend a lot of time making sure that message is not lost. And that's why we're having this, com having yeah, this conversation here. State Library is, I think, hearing the conversation. Um, it's, you know, I'm not shy about asking for money. And so. I'm not going to be shy either. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to hear it. So, so I, that's, I just, we just wanted to give you, a, like I say, a preliminary um, sort of a timeline as, as well as this is, this is not a conversation we've had before. I mean, we had a conversation back in whatever those two years were that we didn't get. We only got two thirds of our money about, yeah. and I don't know that anybody was on the, were you on the board then? Okay. I mean, and the conversation really was, well, we have a lot of money in the bank. We should spend it, some of it on this, because we never knew. We, I mean, we didn't know what money we were going to get, you know, try to avoid cuts. But things are have been different since then. So, so um, you know, I, I agree with everything that you both just said, uh, Becky and Deirdre, but I guess I, I look also at the, you know, the, the staff really it shouldn't be the board issue. The staff needs to create the break glass in case of emergency yes. planning. Yep. Because yep. no matter how much we all might dream of advocating for and getting more funding, what if that just never happens? Right. And right. and so there's going to be, as everybody knows, there's going to be that point in time where if we just keep going the way we're going, it'll be it'll start to run a deficit. And I don't think they should no, I don't think we should ever run it up. So, and that's if that's if that point in time where that intersects is a year down the road or two years yep. down the road. Yep. We need to have things ready to break glass in case of that emergency. Yep. And this is this thing here needs to stop, or that thing needs to stop, or right. pull and, back fifty percent, or and we, you know, we did have a little bit of practice at that this yeah. year because we deferred our expenditures. You know, sure. we we didn't do raises, we didn't put that in the budget, we didn't buy vehicles, we didn't buy laptops. I mean can't go on with that either um but we talked about you know some serious um you know i mean if we had a 10 percent uh, cut in funding you know we might have to i mean you, you can't cut it doesn't make sense it never has to me to just well cut everything by 10 percent because some things you can do that and some things you, you can't and you just have to you know decide that's the that's the, that's the hard job of being you know leaders and managers but yeah i mean you know, all, all the programs, we, we would have to look at them. Um, you know, everything from the LSAPs. I mean, that's this is another reason that we had, you know, made the big push for, um, you know, their own, you know, self-sustainability. Um, if that's a word, you know what I mean, that they can't d depend on us forever because we don't just serve them. But on the other hand, we do serve them. But, you know, what about all the training needs that, that you know, Dan was talking about and that Joe could tell you about? 
Um, you know, EDI is a new initiative. Should we not do that? Well, obviously we have to do that. I mean, that's a huge need amongst our libraries. So, you know, it's a, it's, you know, like I say, needs are increasing. And I think the pandemic has caused libraries to expect more of us. And they, you know, which is good too, because we want to be, you know, we want to be there to serve them. Um, but you're absolutely right, Scott. Yeah, I mean, it, it is and will be a tough conversation to have to prioritize everything. But, you know, you almost have to. I mean, personally, I, I would vote for the absolute very last service that Rails could provide would be delivery. <laughs> like, like this, that should well, be the sure. last thing. Yes. Have. But, oh. but see, this is another reason that I think the you know, investment in, in, in things that would make delivery less expensive True. is really important too. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just which would all, which, you know, the, the, what I'm thinking about in terms of, la you know, label us. I mean, you guys were at the, you were here, everybody heard the, the report from Greg Kronovitz, the label is sorting. Right would save us some, but it would really save the library's money. And that's important too. Right. So it's all a piece. Yeah. I, as someone who's new, this is Becky. I'm happy to hear you say that you're not a fan of if there's a 10% cut across the board, because I'm not either. And I don't know these things because I haven't been part of it. So I just agree with that also. That was nice to hear because it is a target. You have to make these hard choices. We have to make the hard choices and let the staff tell us, but we also have to not be okay with funding from the state not going up for 10 years, which is not okay. I agree with because, that. And, and I've always been an advocate of this. That's not okay because we're expected to keep paying people a cost of living increase. We're expected to pay increases that go up each year and to not ever add that into our funding while still expecting we have to, the publishers aren't going to give us books for less. The delivery isn't going to cost us. Gas isn't going to stay the same. That's not okay. And that's where I think the advocacy needs to happen because that's untenable in the best of times. But right. yes, I agree. We, the staff is in charge of telling us what the reality you know, is. And all of our outreach is the, yeah. The reality is though that while we can advocate, um, politicians may or may not um, vote for that. Um, so, you know, so Scott is correct in the fact that we will have to be realistic in the fact that uh, that we have to plan for that, you know, for that time where, you know, we may or may not have that money. Um, and I and I think that one of the things that that, you know, that we could look at is what are the services that are are used the most? So, like delivery, like mm -hmm. you know, professional development, uh, you know, those kinds of things that are are most used. You know, what percentages of the members are using our services mostly? Um, you know, can we say that these are what are used the most? You know. Uh, that, uh, that you could say, you know, these are like ranked almost uh, to say that, that where our budget dollars go that way, you know, so that uh, mm -hmm. if you had to like, you know, instead of doing a straight, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of just doing a 10% straight across the board either. Um, but if you had to, if you had to cut, cut those things that are not being used as opposed to cutting those things that are most used, like delivery and things like that, I would never be in favor of cutting those things. And you know, I might, I, 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 this I, is Jim again. Um, I'll, just as a background, delivery costs typically run about thirty percent of our total costs, and our LSAP support is twenty percent. So that's fifty percent of our budget right there on two major, major programs. And uh, when I do the budget commentary, I will do, be uh, presenting, as I do every year, a listing of the uh, special uh, programs that we have, uh, uh, grants uh, and so forth to libraries uh, and uh, the CE spending and various consulting. So it's kind of a pick and choose uh, from all that of 
the what can uh, what can go away or what isn't uh, used as much or how can we save on on these areas? I will say, Becky. I mean, you know, I worked for the systems, and I've got a history with the systems that goes back to the to the '90s, and my entire history with the systems has been flat or cut funding. Mm -hmm. And you know, we frankly did too good a job with reduced funding over those years. We really stretched ourselves, made things work, and made it. We did do more with less, but that reached a breaking point for staff and, and whatnot. But you know. And I'm certainly in favor of the advocacy. We need to do that. But, you know, I agree with the other things. The comments have been said we are going to have to take a hard look at things because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a lot, you know, the deficit spending per year with, you know, where there's actually funding available is fine, but it, it becomes untenable very quickly. Yep. And Paul, I agree with you. I mean, I've been doing this 20 years, you know, so I've seen it too. And I agree. I've had to make these hard decisions. We're going to have to do it. But I also will not stand by and just say it's always been that way and we haven't been given the money and we've had to make ourselves look good for less. There's a time when that's going to break and fail and we'd like to get ahead of when. Oh, certainly. You know, and I just so we can do both, right? We can make the hard looks and keep advocating. Oh, yeah, because, for sure. Yeah. Because this idea in libraries in general that, well, that's the way it is. Oh, well, people disrespect us. People don't give us what we need and we figure it out is starting to cut to a breaking point. And you see it with staff on the front lines right now who are, I know so many librarians who are really good who are quitting because of things that are happening that use that attitude, maybe not with budgeting. And we've got to stop this hemorrhaging at some point. So we have to do both. I completely agree, but we really, really need to make it clear that we are important to people, especially during a pandemic, that they saw that and we can't keep being disrespected with a lack of increase in funding. Just like infrastructure, same thing, right? We pushed it down the road mm -hmm. and our roads and bridges are all failing. This <laughs> is a larger issue that we can't be quiet about too. Well, that's what we wanted to say about the budget for now. You'll be hearing lots more. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up is item 8.4 and which is strategic planning um, and Monica and Deidre will talk about that. Yes, this is again very, this is just preliminary, but you know, next year, I guess, or FY22 is the, I guess our 11th fiscal year. So I don't know when you, I don't know how you figure out what the anniversary is exactly, but um, <laughs> And, you know, we did our first strategic plan in 2013, 2014. We spent about, we hired consultants. I mean, it was a brand new organization. It was, you know, complicated. Um, hired some consult consultants, did a great job. Um, I think we spent about $25,000, $30,000 on it. Um, they did a lot of research and focus groups and got a lot of feedback. Last time we did it in, I think, 17, 18, we just did an update. We didn't hire anybody to help us. We just, staff did it. We went on big listening tours and, and, and you know, it, we learned a lot and we, we added things to it. Um, like uh, My Library Is came from that. And, um, you know, really EDI in some ways came from that too. Um, uh, so, um, but this time I think it's time for us to really do a kind of a re, a good relook, you know, and, uh, bring somebody in because it's, you know, lots changed in the past 10 or 11 years, not just in our funding, obviously, but in the world. Um, and it's, I think that, you know, while we consider ourselves at Rails to be very connected with our members and very um, knowledgeable about what they need. I think it's also good to bring in somebody who's objective and can really tell you, no, you know, we know you like this program and it's good and all that, but really, you know, you need to think about doing this. These are, these are future needs or these are, this is, these are trending things. So, um, we're starting to get proposals. Um, we think uh, Monica and I have been talking a bit, um, you know, start with the new fiscal year makes sense if we can. Then again, that's the summer. It's not a great time to do 
you know, meetings with school libraries, especially probably, but just the people in general, maybe. But, you know, we got to get started on it. So we just wanted you to know about that. What, what would you like to add? I think just in addition to what you said about how many things have changed over the last 10 years, we're living in a very unique time. We know the pandemic is going to change all kinds of industries and worlds, and we don't always know what that's going to mean for libraries. And so I think it's a great time for analysis yeah. and a great time to hear from people in terms of what they want in a new age. So the timing is, is like in that. Place. Right. I think, yeah, I think it's, I wouldn't want to be in the midst of it right now because things are still up in the air so much, but I'm thinking that maybe by the fall, you know, when we really get in winter, when we really get engaged in it, things will be more, there'll be, you know, a firmer sense of what the near future long-term present holds. <laughs> you don't know what that means, you know, but you know what I mean. It's just, yeah. So uh, so we just wanted to let you know about that and that we probably will need to spend some money on it to do it right. But that Any, at least is a one-time expense. Yeah. Anything else on uh, strategic planning? I mean, you saw the uh, proposal in your packet. No, I didn't include, I just sent that to you, Michael, for your, uh, oh, okay. your own sorry. purposes, but I yeah. can certainly send you the one, I'll send everybody the one proposal that we've received just so you can get a sense. I, I actually, you know, just, you know, just so you know, I've seen that proposal and, you know, I do consulting and um, the proposal is, is pretty in line with what consultants are, are charging. So it's, it's pretty, you know, you know, in line for what consultants are doing for strategic planning. So, um, this is Becky, do we have an official RFP out? Is that no? We don't oh, have okay. to do an RFP's professional services. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious if. if oh, go ahead. No, Paul. Sorry, Michael. No, go no, ahead. I'm just curious. Were, were you reaching out to multiple consultants? Or yeah, we you, yes, we will. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd just be just just for my own organization, actually, I'd just be curious who your list is because it's something we're looking at next year too. So I'd, if you've already like kind of like done the legwork of then if I do doing the work, I'd, sure. I'd love to take advantage of it. Sure. So they, are we. I <laughs> look at it too. Sure. I mean the one the what proposal what we've received so far is from Stephanie Chase, who is from oh. is constructive disruption. <laughs> um, you know, we're it's a little different because we're not a library, right, you know, right. so we kind of look at different things, but by all means, we Just, can, oh, yeah. 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 I, also, I also gave um, Deidre a list because our library is yep. doing that too. Um, and we just had three proposals done. Um, so I have a list of, of people who are local who are doing specific library uh, strategic planning too that have reasonable proposals too. I'd, I'd love to see that too, Michael, if you don't mind sharing. Sure, no problem. Uh, item 8.5, the future of virtual and in-person meetings. Um, so as you know, you've heard from the governor, we're now in phase four plus of the five uh, phase restore Illinois mitigation plan. And I wanted to get your thoughts about planning for future meetings um, and whether we should go back to in-person um, board meetings or um, in-person plus board meetings, um, possibly. Thoughts? I mean, people could, I would assume, still attend via Zoom if they exactly prefer. But we're. I and think we had it's people just, who it's some, I saying, we had people who attended ahead. before via Zoom. Um, in right. the past, even before the pandemic, and it seemed to work out okay. Mm -hmm. So we could definitely have some sort of hybrid model as long as, as we were conforming to whatever the law says, right? Right. Okay. And that actually, Sarah, to follow up on what Sarah was saying, that my question was, I, I don't remember this, pre-pandemic, you know, obviously we're operating, operating underneath the disaster proclamation. Pre-pandemic, I know um, any unit of local government that covers more than 4,000 square miles had some some exceptions carved out in the Open Meetings Act. What were the requirements, assuming that when the, the, the disaster proclamation goes away, which eventually it, you know, it will, life will, life will be better and we won't be in a disaster. Um, what were the requirements for quorum? Physically? We had to have a physical quorum in our 
in our yeah. buildings or in places that were open to the public. Did I say that right, physical, Emily? Okay. Can we explain that yeah. a little more. So it has sure. to be, yes. Whereas now, the you know obviously we don't have a quorum in a physical place, right? right? right. Whereas before, you could have people here, uh, people in Peoria. You could have, I remember Michelle Simmons used to attend from Monmouth, her Monmouth? library, yeah. Monmouth College yeah. Library office, because it was posted there and people could get into the, you know, could attend the meeting right. there. I, essentially, I think the public has to be able to attend where the quorum is. Physically attend the so meeting. Yes, physically. It has, Eight. It, has, okay. it has to be able to be, it has to be properly posted. The agenda has to be posted 48 hours before and the public must have access to where the meeting is taking place for those people to be counted in the quorum. So how many are in East Peoria right now, for example? Three. Tom and Diane. So we actually have eight. I think just two, actually. No, three. Oh, three. Sue's there. Oh, Sue, are you there? I'm, I didn't know. Yeah. I'm here, yeah. <laughs> so we're currently one short. Four, yeah. So it, it wouldn't be that hard to say somebody go to their library that's open to also right i'm just i'm just saying we don't have to i mean i think the point oh, is okay. we don't have to the the exception for the quorum still exists right but we can do it i mean we're ha and we're happy to do it as i mean we still need to abide by the laws as, right. and wear masks and all that but we're so we're i mean michael wanted to ask because it just would it just means that we you know, it was a little bit more staff preparation in terms of the buildings and it's fine. That's what we're here for, you know. That's why we have build one of the reasons we have buildings. Are we and it starts to, and it starts to build that board engagement some more for right. us and that kind of thing that people are asking for. Right, because it came up on the board engagement. Are we um can I just ask the question? This is Becky. The schools are now doing three feet. Are we supposed to do six feet or are we eligible for three feet? I haven't heard that that changed just, for us. I think, that was just I, for I think it was children, just for right? children. Yeah. yeah, okay. That's what I'm just asking in terms of fi figuring it out. Yeah, we're operating under the office capacity rules uh, that exist. So I think we're at 50% and are moving to 60% in the bridge to phase five, you know, kind of okay. space. But it would just be dependent on what the board preferred. And it is important to start talking about this because at some point we're going to have to figure it out. So, yeah, yeah but I'm, so. I'm happy to see we're almost there. <laughs> so I guess maybe all we need to do is just encourage people to attend in person if you want to. Right. And see what happens, I guess. I mean, in a month, it'll be all different again, probably. I mean, it'll be have <laughs> opened up that more. You know what I mean? It's no. just. You know, while, while I'm sitting here, I just got an email from McHenry County um, saying that they're opening up um, vaccinations to anybody over age 16. Oh, that's that was great just announced news. today, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's really good. So they anybody over yeah. age 16 can get a, a vaccine with a um, with an appointment. So, um, so hopefully other counties are doing the same thing. So. Um, so, uh, so, you know, in a month that could change a lot of things for a lot of people. So yeah, that's true. There's just such a big range of how institutions are responding to this. Mine is closed and will be for the foreseeable future still, not really allowed to work away from home. <laughs> so if okay. I, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll be this way till January, most likely. So. Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, that's why we, that's, that's why we don't have to do it, you know, but yeah. If we, exactly. Yeah. Wow. As long as Why we, January, Jennifer? Just because of everything. Everything is uh, in the very limited on-site activity through the fall term, basically. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the library is not open, and we won't we won't be opening for the, the summer or fall. So. Okay. <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> Get comfortable at home. Yeah. And I was saying that we'll probably be mostly back in, back in the classroom with regular operations in the fall. That's what, yeah. We're going to write out the rest of this through this through the summer the way that we've been operating currently. Interesting. 
That's our prediction. Our it can change. Yeah. Yeah, right. Our high school announced straight up Lyons Township, so it's a large district that they're going back in the fall. And if the state requires virtual, it will not be as good as being in person. They straight up said that. Yeah. So it's all different everywhere. Yep. Yeah, my, my daughter is, uh, they have been doing hybrid and after spring break, they're all going full time in high school. So, yeah. My son's four days a week in high school now, yeah. Yeah. In person. Well, we'll just, we'll set it up next time to be more in person, to, okay. to, be, to make that more possible across the system and see and what, please, see and how it please goes. do not feel pressured if you, if you do not feel comfortable, nobody is pressuring right. you, you know, Feel free to zoom, you know, or, or go right. to one of the um, to the smaller sites in East Peoria. Or um, do we do we still have the opportunity to post those um, at the other uh, key places that we've done in the past? Uh, you mean like Coal Valley? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we state we library. Could, yeah. So we certainly could do that too. Still. Yep, that's what we'll do. Yeah. So, okay. So, thank you for that feedback. Um, okay, let's move to uh, number nine, unfinished business. Uh, nine point one. The you know we've we've kind of teased you with the board engagement survey results. <laughs> uh, so, DJ, so, do, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. With the whole board, I. I, I assume, um, but I just want to start out by saying thank you to everybody for filling this out. It was really helpful to us. And I think we'll, you know, obviously the whole point is to make the, make everything better, you know, make your board experience better, make the meetings better, make participation easier, make our reports easier to digest and more interesting, understandable, whatever. Um, so thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, I, you know, Michael already, we already took a break. So, you know, we, that was a great suggestion. Um, and we're, you know, I, as you go through the report, um, you'll see that we um, have, you know, uh, you know, offered some suggested follow-up for some of your um, your suggestions, and um, we will do the things in here that we said we would do. Um, there, there was a lot in here about, you know, more networking, you know, building relationships, etc., which, you know, opening it up for more in-person meetings is helpful. I mean, some of that we just can't do much about until there is no more pandemic. Um, so, um, you know, our report, we're gonna, we, you know, work on our reports to make them more interesting, more digestible for you all. So I don't know if, how you wanna do this, Michael. Do you wanna go through the whole thing page by page? Do you wanna ask people to, ask questions or do you want why don't we you want to go right, through it kind of like what you and i did when um because people have a copy of this and kind of hit the yep. highlights because when you and i had uh, gone through where there were the the major comments um like right on the, the board um job description um, yep that's so, on page so, so yeah so why don't we go through that one where there were a lot of um, um comments yep. on that Right, so that's on one pages one and two. So we could certainly um, at the bottom of page one add a calendar, create a calendar that shows on shows the various things that are going on in the library world. If that if that was what if that seems like it would help to keep you all keep all of us actually more aware of the ongoing things. Um, uh, you know, provide suggestions for networking opportunities. Um, we can, we'll certainly um, can give you more information on a regular basis in monthly report about what we do and examples of how to be an ambassador or how, you know, how to, how to highlight, I mean, how to advocate for different things. Um, so yes, we we can certainly do that. Um, 
And then, um, so that, and then down on page three, there was a lot more about the, there's a lot about the board meetings, um, taking a break, um, summarizing what, after Maybe. we've come to a, a decision, yep. That was a, a key one that you and I had talked about, and um, yep. that was something that, uh, whether it's me, whether it's a future uh, board chairman, uh, that uh, that we should always stop and and summarize that. Either myself or our our Deidre should um, should do that, especially if there's a lot of discussion on that. Um, so, yep, and. Uh... Also, um, a summary of committee meetings um, was was suggested. Certainly, it, it, the staff can do that, or with the assistance of the committee chairs, if you all think that's a good idea. Anybody? I like to the point that this is Becky of getting it ahead of time, so that sort of like. The director's report, right? That we see it at a time and then the highlights are discussed. It would be easier to digest the major issues. Would, would we, uh, this is Scott, um, if we do that, would then at that part of the agenda just say you received the report in your packet? Were there any questions? And there would not be a report during the meeting? Is that, that might make the meeting. That was more. sort of, that was my assumption. Yeah. I don't know how, I mean, you're, a, what do you think, Paul, you're a committee? I mean, it'd be interesting to perhaps ask the committee chairs what they think. So it, it'd be fine. I, go ahead. Oh, no, please go ahead. I was just going to ask, so are we saying that we would add um, those reports to the consent agenda instead of having the reports? I think, or just to the rails report, maybe. I would suggest that so Jenna, like uh, if you were if you said if you submitted your report, I would say, um, are there any questions about about the advocacy uh, meeting report? I would like for you to I would like to um, you know highlight this specific issue X Y Z because this is the most important issue that we discussed. You know, if okay. there was one key issue, if there wasn't then, you know, we, we met, you know, I've highlighted the key issues that we discussed, move on. But if there was something that was really important, I think it, I think it does, you know, I think it does, it's important that you bring it to the board's attention. Sure. So then um, I know Karen, uh, Karen Goyer takes excellent notes during um, our advocacy committee meetings are, would, would it be possible to, rather than having the committee chairs write separate reports, would it be possible to post the, the meeting minutes for everybody for the committee meetings rather than, I, I don't know, what are, would, what are people, what would you, what people who are not, like I know that I, I chair the advocacy committee and people who are on the advocacy committee clearly know what is going on, but what would be most helpful for for the rest of the board. Let me just say in answer to your question, Jenna, we could do that depending on the timing. That's all. That, but I would think it would be fine. Yes. Timing is the issue that Deirdre made. Just as an example, for you know, in April, the Rails board meetings, um, Friday, April 23rd, consortium committee meetings is meeting Monday, April 19th. So you know, certainly a report could be written, but it wouldn't be ready when the rest of the packet was because, you know, the packet will have gone out before mm -hmm. the meetings even happen. But those are just minor timing right. issues. So somebody I, like in East Peoria, Peoria, I think somebody in East Peoria has something to say. Yeah, yes. I'm in favor of uh, the suggestion proposed by Mike. Um, I think that reading a report that's, that's compiled and sent out by the rail staff would be sufficient. And then, as Mike said, just point out, highlight, and place emphasis on um, items that really are need to be drawn to the attention of the board members. I think that's kind of just, it's plain, simple, and streamlined, and, and I think that would serve the purpose. Okay. As, as a trustee, I think having the, the written report in advance would be, uh, would be helpful. Um, but for 
uh, members watching either the live stream or the recording, I, I think it's also beneficial to have at least uh, some uh, summary from the committee chair for the for the recording for those watching. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they they have access to the documents, but you don't know if they would have had the opportunity. So I wonder then if, if I can just add to that. I wonder then if um, I know as a committee chair, I would be happy to prepare a report. Would it be possible to create some sort of a report submission form to have consistency across all of the committee reports? I do. So I have a tendency to maybe overdo oh, it a little bit and include too many details. Um, <laughs> but something that would be um, informative, but also shortened to the point, and that would also make sure that we're soliciting the same type of information from all of the committees would be something that would be helpful for me. And I would find it um, less, um, I don't want, cumbersome is not the word, but less um, time consuming to try to figure out how to format it if we had something that was consistent um, across all the committees. It would help with, it would aid with reading those as well. So, because then each of us would know just like, oh, here, 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 that's where the information is. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, exactly. This is Becky, I love that idea, Jenna. That's a really okay, good idea. Okay, great. Uh, okay, we already talked um, about. Yes. Um, one thing for EDI, now that we have the subcommittees in place, how would we present that or how will we um, combine all three of those separate uh, subcommittee reports? Will that be something? Also, in addition to the EDI overall, our report for the month or every other month. I mean, I'm kind of unclear of how this would be for us for the EDI. Sure, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think that the board should know what the committees are and the members should know what the committees are doing, subcommittees. I think, you know, we have staff will be at the subcommittee meetings couple rail staff, I think we can rely upon them as well as whoever is leading the meeting to, to put that together. But I, I think the information should be conveyed. Thank you. Yep, yeah, but it'll be somebody who's at the meeting who's okay, responsible. Thank you. Yep, good question. So we talked about, you know, doing our meetings kind of more in person and for networking and relationship building, or I don't know if there are any virtual ways we can do that now. Um, that's a question we asked. Anybody have any ideas? Uh, this is Tom. I have a um, question about the networking opportunities, uh, like the north of 47, uh, the Rock Island group, those aren't appearing in L2 as much as they did prior to the new L2 coming out. Uh, you know, uh, rural directors meeting uh, for Central Illinois was last week, it, and it was not on L2. Is there a way hmm. we can okay. get back to those groups to make sure they get into L2? Does anybody out there who knows the answer to that question? I don't know why they're not showing up. Hey, Deirdre, can I answer this question? Yes, uh, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, we've been working with our networking groups. Uh, the process is just a little bit different. And one of the things that we've had to do is we've had to add, we physically have to add the networking groups to L2 and then for them to get access to the calendar to add their own events. It's just taken a little bit of time to, to do education and training behind that. Uh, Tom, I, 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 I appreciate that um, you pointing that out. I know that um, the, the way that the new L2 calendar works, rail staff no longer has to, we, we uh, don't have to do it for them. They can do it themselves. But in, do, in making that transition, we just have to do a better job of educating them. And I know that the L2 team has uh, come up with a lot of great documentation behind that. Um, but uh, that has just been a little bit of a slow process so far. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. Well, if anybody has any ideas, let me know for virtual ways to 
have more networking for board members, both with other groups as well as with yourselves? Because I was kind of reading this for yourselves too. I feel like I want this, but at the same time, I don't want to have any of these like forced like social zooms <laughs> too. Like I'm so sick of them also like at night and weekends because I have a lot of meetings with other boards I'm on where we meet night and weekends. But yet I feel like we need it because as somebody who's new, I really don't know a lot of the people. Well, we have to think about the whole quorum thing with that. Right, thing. it has to be public. It's tricky, it yeah. Be, yeah, I know. So, so I'm still thinking about it. Um, pre, uh, I'm just going to keep going in the interest of time. Um, presentation by Rails member libraries, absolutely. Um, if you have any particular topics or other suggestions, that I think would be great. Um, and then this last one on page three, I didn't completely understand. A document with action items for the topics we discuss. Maybe a separate document in the board packet. The um, I always try to put something in my report or a separate memo about items that are on the agenda. I, is that what you're referring to or did you want more information or is it something completely that I'm just missing entirely? Something completely different. Anybody know? I read that, um, it was not my comment, but I read that as um, if we talk about something during a meeting, um, what what's the action item associated with that? Who's going to do it? What's gonna happen between this meeting and the next meeting so that we can follow up? I don't know if that's, okay. if that's adequately re representing whomever made the comment, but that's how I understood it. It's what I try to do during advocacy committee meetings like, what are we going to do between now and next time? Who's going to do it so that we can follow up with that person and know that the um, we're, our conversations are becoming something actionable? That's how I took it, too. This yeah. yeah. That's how I read that, too, Jenna. I think it's so that's not, the, yeah, that's think not the same right. as number. Pardon? I think it's what you and I talked about when we discussed this is that um, when we recap, it's right. It's the um, who is going to do it and uh, what is the outcome of this. So, so it goes back almost to the other one that we discussed earlier of um, a summary. Okay, that's that would be the number, the second suggestion on page right, three. Exactly. That, okay, if they're the same, that that's fine. I am that I understand. Okay. And, okay. Well, I want to clarify a little because Jenna, you made a good point. So, is this something that would go out after the meeting, sort of? Like when you do that for advocacy, do you do it at the end of your meeting? Yes. Do you send it yes. out after? Okay. So yes. it is. So, okay. We well, we it's talk about it during the meeting, and then it becomes a part of the okay. minutes. Um. For next time, but it, it, I think it just really helps us know that um, our conversations are going somewhere, and it also reminds us to to be engaged. And I think it's participatory. So if I know if I have things to follow up on, I can be actively moving toward that, so I have something to report to the next meeting. But yes, we we include that as part right before we do agenda building. We say what are our action items and who is responsible for those things. Thank you. That's helpful. So, dear, were you asking about the the, the, the bottom one, the, the last? Yes. Right. We, I think, we, I think we're all talking about the second one in that chart, but she was asking about the bottom one. No, I'm asking about the bottom one. Oh, okay. I understand the second one. If it's the same as the bottom one, Seems similar. Yeah. I, I, oh, okay. So maybe it's next steps, kind of a thing. Maybe. Well, we will discuss this internally, I guess. And if somebody wants to, if somebody has better ideas after this meeting, please let me know because I'm, we're just trying to do what you want us to do. Um, 
wait a minute. Is there a more to it here? It says maybe a separate document in the board packet that is just a bulleted list of action items with dates. Something easy for board members to refer to. I apologize. That was on the, another page. Mm -hmm. Yes, a bulleted list of action items is possible. It's not a, apropos for everything, obviously. You know, it wouldn't be. But you can't make a document with action items of topics we discussed before the meeting, too. That's why that confused me. This this comment. Right. So it has to be something more like what Jenna said, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that combines the second comment and this last comment. Okay. I think I know. I'll, I'll practice on the board engagement survey results and see at the next meeting and see how it worked. Um, let's see, participation in the board meetings and ensuring everybody has a has um, opportunity to speak. Do you want to talk about this, Michael? Yeah, we just, uh, you know, um, we're making it as much as possible to make sure that everybody has a voice um, and so that it's not just uh, just one or two people speaking uh, and that those um, that are in Burr Ridge, um, you know, it's it's easier that, you know, you, if you're on Zoom, you have the opportunity to, to raise your hand. Um, and so, um, you know, remember that this is a 15 um, member um, board. Um, and not uh, just for those people in East Peoria or in Burr Ridge. Um, so, um, so we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity and that, you know, we realize um, that there's always going to be what I call creative conflict um, uh, because you have librarians and you have trustees on the board. Um, and, um, but um, we want to hear from everybody because everybody has a voice. And uh, so feel free um, to speak up because your voice is valuable on this on this board. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I just implore you to, to speak up um, no matter what, um, you know, raise your hand clap your hands, do whatever you got to do, because I know it's hard on Zoom. But, um, you know, please, please, please speak up because we, we, we really value what you have to say here. And Deidre, do you have anything more to, to say on that? Um, you know, and I know it's really hard when you're on Zoom on that, but um, we, we have got um, to get everybody's voice on this because it's, um, it's just so important um, to get um, other people's input on this. I, I think we do. There is a hand raise feature on Zoom, right? There is. If you look at the bottom here. Um, is it? I don't know. I, I thought it was, but maybe not. Hi, I is, don't know. This is Ryan. Um, you only have a hand raise feature if you're a participant oh, not, okay. or an attendee. Not oh, Correct. Yeah, not not panelists. Yeah. Um, so um, at, at any rate, you can. Well, have, I thought you could. I yes, you could raise your real hand. I, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Or you could just start talking like exactly. I do. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought I was promoted to panelist when I joined, and I have the raise hand feature on the bottom of my screen. All right, well, let us, this is obviously a little technical uh -huh. issue we'll, we'll figure out. Um, but as, yeah, I mean, I- get people I, more together, oh, it becomes less of an issue. Um, but, um, you know. I, right, I think I, this has always been an issue as, you know, some, some of us you have said. I do think that I and the board president can make a special effort to, um, you know, wait. There's also a delay, which doesn't help matters, um, just built into the system. So just, you know, make an extra point of pausing and asking for questions is not that which Michael does, but 
just being more conscious, I think, all of this. And, and if so. you, you know, if you catch me and I don't, and, you know, if I don't give it, you know, some of you who are more extroverted than others, please, you know, stop me. And, um, you know, I'm only human. So, you know, I, it, I don't take offense to that at all. Um, I, I don't have that, you know, in me. So, um, I, you know, please just say, hey, Michael, somebody may have something, you know, so I'm, I'm more than open to that because I totally respect, you know, people to, to give their opinion and to ask that because I really do um, want to make this um, a, a good organization. So, um, so um, and the other piece of this is, um, you know, I think it's important um, that, uh, you know, that, um, you know, when you have um, so many people, you know, some people are just not uh, so extroverted or, you know, they're more introverted. So it's, it's not so hard, easy for them to, to do that. So, so we get that. So, um, uh, right. Any other comments, questions on that? Any way that we can make that better? Um, I just wanted to ask if any of my colleagues here or who are listening today, board member colleagues, if if you have any time, could you reach out to me? Because I don't want to impose on your time, but for myself, some I mean, I'm between a garrulous nature if you really know me, and here I am very quiet, and partly because I don't know if I am missing something i mean i've been out of uh, the public library employment for about oh gosh i retired in 2012 and i just retired from academic setting and i used to work at a special library so i can see little bits and pieces from each facet of my life and it's helped so much having tom as my as my mentor but you know i want to get to know others and so if you have a little time Sometimes I worry, I fret about, well, if I say this, you know, does this look stupid? Not even truly. And if I bounce it off of somebody like, like I do Tom and ask him a lot of questions, so much so that he's been so gracious, <laughs> I, I would just be very appreciative because if I have an idea or how does this sound, I'd like to just bounce it off of you or share it before I do say something at the meeting. Would that be possible? And I don't want to impose on anyone's time, but I, it would sure be helpful. Thank you. I, I think that's a little, that's an example of a kind of a networking that you can do mm -hmm. virtually. It's not in a group, but it's still bought, you know, getting to know each other. And I think that's great. Thank you. Of course, but don't ever. Don't, I mean, you know, just on that point, I don't. I don't think that you should ever feel inadequate or anything like that. I don't work in a library. I'm a library trustee. I, I mean, I work in education consulting. So, I mean, I, I mean, you know. So, you know, there's a lot more people who are ten times smarter than me on libraries that are on this board. So, um, I trust them um, implicitly. Uh, on, you know, libraries on that. So, you know, feel free to, um, you, you know, your, your um, opinion on this stuff is still valuable uh, on this. It doesn't mean that you have to be an expert on this. So. Okay, thank you. I understand where, where that impulse of, feel, of feeling inadequate might come from, but I think it's also worth mentioning that we all got here the same way. We were elected to this board. Right. So <laughs> clearly at some point, someone thought that we were competent enough to be given this responsibility. And I, I you know, and certainly I think you're all competent. Yeah, <laughs> right? and, and, uh, and, and you should feel free to reach out to other people on the board too, to, to get their opinion on stuff too, so. I know that the the common refrain at this refrain at the school where I work is assume goodwill. Yep. And um, I know assume can be a dangerous sort of word, but I think in a context like this, where we're all in leadership positions, like Sarah said, we were all elected for our various expertise and the various background and um, 
experiences that we bring. And so I would say to Diane and anybody else, uh, assume goodwill. Assume that if you hear from another board member that they are um, wanting to reach out in a positive way. Um, so I would just wanted to put that out there too. I think that was a really, a really sweet sentiment. The assume goodwill. I think that that's, I think that's really beautiful. Yep. <laughs> it's really hard for us to communicate here because of the, of the lag in Zoom and because we can't always see each other's faces and read them as we're thinking about whatever or, or what we want to say. So I think that um, the assume goodwill or just have patience and sort of sort of forgive yourself if you say something kind of weird or if you interrupt someone. So <laughs> this is just, just, just going to have to be the nature of the communication until it's not. And I think that like I know that like, I certainly don't mind if I'm being interrupted in a meeting like this because I don't see a way around that anyway. I don't, um, but I definitely feel like I have the, the ability to say whatever, whatever thought pops into my head if I so choose. So I guess I'm just saying, um, if you don't feel that way, I encourage you to <laughs> feel that way. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I certainly understand, like, like this, is just, this is just really difficult communication, a very difficult medium for communication. I get that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, section was uh, the board reports. Yes. So um, it looks like the uh, this month at Rails and my report were, were pretty okay. Um, there's some suggestions about the uh, financial report. I and Jim already took action by including a summary in the financial report. Um, now the financial report, you know, is it's about numbers. So if you're good at numbers, it's probably easier than if you're not good at numbers. But um, we can certainly, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, every other month or so or you know, look at a particular part of the financial report. We do talk about this a lot in orientation because um, there's some, you know, we provide you a lot of information. Some of it is more, I don't know if important is the right word. Some of it changes more often in terms of like, you know, the monthly reports. Um, so we'll work on that. Um, and then in terms of the strategic plan progress report, there was a lot of consensus to having smaller, um, you know, individual reports on different aspects. And I think what we did with the LSAPs is a good example, you know, I mean, focus on uh, a major, start with the major programs and, you know, think of it as also as like a budget. It's also kind of a budget slash financial report in terms of how much we spend, et cetera. Um, so we already do, you know, the service of the month reports, um, but we'll keep looking for more. We, you know, there's a range of topics that you all suggest, which are great. Um, so we'll keep working on those. There are a lot of great suggestions about, um, you know, state library. I mean, I, you know, Greg does his monthly report, which is very, we really appreciate, but just to have a report from the state library or an agenda topic probably at one meeting about what it, the range of things you do, because, you know, a lot of people, I mean, we used to do that at the joint board meetings, really. Um, I think that'd be really useful because it's very foundational and it's true that some of us in at this meeting know it pretty well and some of us don't. And that's, there's no, that's, that's just a way because of who we are and what jobs we've had. So I'm looking at Paul, I mean, but there's others of you who have a lot of experience in this area. Does that sound okay, Greg? I think that would be really good. Yeah, I think an overview of, of the entire state library, certainly that's a way to engage the newer board members or those we've not exactly. interact with in the past. That's, that's important. Yep, thank you. Um, and just other, you know, for example, with what we're doing with Isle and, uh, you know, other groups. Um, so we appreciate all those suggestions. We will certainly act on them. And um, we'll just keep doing the best we can. Like I say, we really appreciate all of this. And I think, you know, in terms of like next steps with this, um, I think what we will do is um, at the next meeting, we will have a 
I will present a report on what we've done so far in response to this survey and what and what else is pending. Is that a, re, a decent? So we've agreed, you know, on some on things related to participation, things related to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, changes in reports. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I will. I'll present a follow up report. Does that sound all right? Hey, thank you for this, uh, you know, for doing this because this was a really good thing. I think we should do this every year. So. Yep. I think you're right. Yep. Um, okay, next up is the statewide uh, database proposal update uh, for discussion only. Uh, Deidre? Yes, I um, just, you know, we did put feelers out. It has been sent to some legislators. Um, uh, I know um, uh, Becky did get a uh, reply. Um, to her re, uh, request from uh, the aide to uh, the minority leader of the Senate, Senator Jim Durkin. I, um, I don't know that anything has happened in the past week. No, assuming just, not. He reached out and we passed on the information and I gave him some talking points that are important and he said he would look into it. I was on vacation last week until today. I reached back out to him to say I was home and if he wanted to talk more. So he did say that he was busy this week too. So right. we'll see. Right. They seem to be extremely interested in hearing about it. So um, we did, I did in the packet put the um, updated proposal with updated talking points. I think you should feel, you know, just share it with your colleagues. Um, with your boards, with your legislators, and please let me know if we can provide any assistance with in terms of explaining it or advocating for it. That's really all I have to say about it at this point. Nothing else has happened. Okay, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Next up is item number 10, which is uh, the report on the unserved in Illinois. Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about this recently. And, um, you know, anybody, obviously, Sue is the committee chair. Please feel free to chime in. Um, I did include some, a couple of the many um, historical reports that have been done over the years. Um, I, th I think it's very, just to give you some idea of how long this has been talked about. Um, and I think the one from 2000, which is a public library service for all, a report from the summit on the unserved is particularly interesting because of the, um, the fact that it, um, you know, brings up many of the things that we are still talking about. For example, the multiple listing service, um, on, you know, for, yeah. for real estate, um, look, you know, look at that. Is that a barrier? Can that be a help? Um, statewide library services for children should be the first priority. I mean, it's just, it's like, <laughs> really? <laughs> it actually says cards for kids. I know. It's, oh, it's on the first. I know. Page. Right. It's, I know. It was like, wow. So, um, you know, concern about school libraries. Um, I mean, there, so there have been, you know, various efforts in the past and, you know, a lot of, you know, have a strategic plan for solving the problem. Um, and, you know, some, you know, interesting ideas in terms of, um, um, you know, don't we use the word universal, use the word foundation level. Um, I mean, just, you know, it's, there's, it's just interesting how there's kind of nothing new under the sun. Um, could there, you know, but all wanting to maintain local control. Um, so I, I just, I thought this was fascinating. Um, what the, you know, this pretty much is still, a lot of it is just still true in terms of what the barriers are and what the 
um, why it's important. Um, on page six, the uh, you know the how can we number six there? How can we get citizens to value and provide funding for library service? I mean, this is something that we still talk about. That really, you know, libraries. I mean, people don't understand what libraries do, and that works against us. Um, and that what the the effect that lack of universal service limits a lot of our sort of statewide coordination, publicity, etc. Uh, let's see. Um, so, you know, I thought you'd get to find this very interesting. Um, you see all the people who were in, involved in it, and there's a questionnaire at the end or a survey kind of, and I think this has probably changed some, but not too much. Um, and then the other the shorter report is, is five years newer. Um, and this has my notes on it. I apologize. I couldn't find a clean copy, but, um, the, uh, there's still about a million residents unserved. It's still about 10%. Um, the, um, there's been a lot of work done. There's no question about that. Um, in addition to, I mean, there was a whole effort, um, project plus, I guess, where the systems worked on bringing, library system, I mean, you know, new territories, um, new um, unserved in. I thought it was all, it was also very interesting that non-contiguous non annexation of areas was also mentioned, it, um, which is, you know, kind of our library merger. That's what I, I call the library merger, but that what there was proposed back in 2000 was actually, I don't think there was a vote that was even being proposed. I think it was just a board could do it boards can do it so um uh so you know i mean at the at, the, at meetings or conversations that we had at the state library a few a couple of years ago with heartland as well um we came to, we agreed that tr trying to get a massive infusion of tax money in order to you know for even if it isn't massive an infusion of tax dollars to provide universal service is probably not going to happen. So we just have been working on it incrementally. And um, it makes me sad, frankly, um, but um, I am, you know, kind of at heart an incrementalist. So I guess it's good that I, you know, I can, I can see, as long as I can see progress, I think that's a good thing. Um, so this is a long-term problem for our state. It definitely um, limits, you know, people's ab ability to, um, you know, make the most of their education, their, you know, their self-training. It's, you know, making, you know, bettering themselves, um, you know, so, but there is, I have no, I have no solution except to just keep working on it um, incrementally, uh, so. This is Becky. I don't think we should underestimate how important the cards for kids going through is, though, to start this conversation on such a wide scope that the questions that are behind all the barriers to universal service are within those arguments. You know, I've been on right. all of Greg's meetings that he's had online with the system and the to explain it. And you see the same questions and concerns coming up about who's going to pay for it, you know, all these, why should they get it if they're not paying? But those are the questions that if we get them at, we are getting, we're getting them answered and we're going to have a program that will demonstrate and seeing it in the, in the older report was enlightening, right? This is a huge thing that's happening and it will help pave the way for more change to come because it's going so. to address all those barriers and we're going to be able to say, see what it did, see we could do it, see how it improved things. And I think it, I, I think it's like a, a bigger increment than we think. I hope so. This is Jennifer. I just, I wanted to say as I keep thinking about this issue, like I feel like we're going to need, this has to have to be a coalition kind of 
push. I just think if we really keep focusing on people who care about public libraries, particularly, just think, I think that we're gonna, I don't know that we're gonna get enough of the support we need. I, I brought this to the attention of our college president and he, and I, and I, I tried to pitch it as a, this is a public education. This is a public higher education issue. This is not a public library issue. And he, he forwarded us, forwarded me to our, um, he got me in contact with our, with our, um, with our lobbyist. And so I'll be following up with her as we go forward, but uh, there's other coalitions, right? Like literacy do page is on right. the campus of COD. So like people who are passionate about literacy, but not necessarily libraries, right? Um, yep. What's the next population economic development group. So what's the next group? We've got to right. show them all why this is their issue and get and activate them in their own spaces, right? Yeah, and I think that's probably a very good agenda item for the next Universal Service Committee is what kind of coalitions we can build. I think that's a great suggestion, Jennifer. Because you're right, I think public libraries, you know, own this, you know, but we can't do it ourselves. Yeah. Dee, this is Sue. Um, yep. Looking looking back over the last, well, I think since the 60s, this has been a concern of um, mm -hmm. libraries. And I think there's been a lot of well-intentioned ideas, and some of the same ideas have popped up over and over again. But I think at one point there was a comment, not much progress has been made. But I think I feel, under your leadership right now, that there has been some significant things done with the Cards with Kids, um, with the veterans, and just it's at the forefront now. And I think that things are starting to loosen up a little bit. So hopefully things will continue. Well, I can't take any credit for those. It's just, it's been just, a, you. It's, it's been a long, <laughs> long, long struggle. And yeah. And like I said, it's been a very well-intentioned struggle, yeah. but things just have not happened until just well, recently. And I see some things going on now. Right. And I, you know, kudos to Greg and the State Library for that. Yes, they, absolutely. The, the uh, you know, the veterans piece was always in there, but. Um, and so was the, actually the ability to have an e-resources card, as I understand it. But the state library just highlighted that, and uh, you know, and some people wish he had, wish they hadn't, I guess. But I'm glad they did because I think th those those are kind of big, like you know, e-resources in particular um, right now are big, and uh, you know, and that's one of the reasons we want the statewide database because that would be accessible to mm -hmm. everybody. Um, yep. So, yeah, I think, you know, you, we just have to keep talking about it and keep working on it. And we will. Yep. Any other questions for Deidre on the um, universal service? Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, next up is on uh, number 11, which is the board rails board member reports. Does anybody have any news to share about their area or library? Okay. We'll move on to number 12, which is the agenda building for the next Rails board meeting. The next Rails board meeting will be held on Friday, April 23rd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Items for the agenda include an update on the Rails discount and group purchases and a report on the future of delivery. Is there anything else at this time we need to add at the agenda for the agenda? Yes, there will be follow up to the engagement survey. Um, we'll see what's going on with, uh, I mean, I guess, I don't know, this will be an agenda item, but theoretically we'll, we will, we should probably, we will be having more of an in-person experience and we can see how that is. Um, and, um, I'm working on my evaluation, which is, has been historically been submitted to the president who distributes it to the board at the April meeting and then is discussed at the May meeting, so. Okay, 
Anything else? That's what I know. Um, I was wondering who do I contact to um, for a quest for IELTS information to be included in the L2? There's something that I uh, would like to know about uh, that IELTS has information, and I've looked on their website. Um, this is the time of year when they have the results of the Children's Choice Award for the state of Illinois. And I've got the titles, but I don't have the winners, but I'd like to also know the vote count for the uh, Monarch Blue Stem Caudle and the Lincoln Awards that are given. And I know that it's it's February and March, and I keep looking and I find the, the list, the master list, but not the um, titles that are have won plus the numbers of votes that each title has um, been given by the students. I was just wondering if that could be included in those two. Diane, Diane, this is Jenna. If you want to send me an email letting me know the information that you want, I can certainly put you in touch with someone who can uh, give you that information. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. There's one more agenda item of the budget for yeah. next time. Okay. How could I forget? Okay, if I don't have anything else, um, then I thank you all for your attendance and I adjourn this meeting at 3.33 p.m. Thanks everybody, have a good weekend. Thank you. Have thank, a you. Good thank you. Bye everyone. Bye, thanks Greg. Bye. Bye.